congregations who joined our family. So that's pretty awesome. And here's the way, and here's the way it works. One of those is called Christopher Creek Christian Church. It's a tiny little mountain church in Payson, Arizona. Way up there. The other church is called Hamilton Hills Community Church in Fishers, Indiana, northwest suburb of Indianapolis. It's a very, very large church. Christopher Creek is a very, very small church. Both have the same mission that we have here today, which is to preach the gospel, right? So you're part of that greater, greater movement. So thank you uh, for being faithful to that. And, and God only knows, right? God only knows. Hey, one last thing. Uh, this doesn't count against my preaching time, right? This is all just hello stuff, right? You know, because I've, I've found that, you know, with di- in the digital realm, as I've been preaching around, a lot of churches are saying, well, you know, people at home don't pay attention, so we're cutting your sermon down to like 25 minutes. And I'm like, okay, well, it takes me 15 minutes to say hello. So that, is, that doesn't count, right? So, you know, you have, you have, here's, the, here's the thing. We're on the outside, and you got four, like, see, one, two, three, four, five, a whole bunch of open doors, so you can just get up and leave anytime you want to. So let's get some leadership at the open doors and make sure that doesn't happen right now. <laughs> Oh, man. So anyway, uh, it, it's, it is a, a privilege to, to be here. And um, so t- it, it's the Christmas season. Did you know that? It's also known as Advent. And Advent's just simply a word that means the coming. And our, our passage of Scripture, we're going to be in it pretty soon in Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to get back to that in, in, just, in just a minute here. But we're going to be in, in Matthew chapter 2. For many of us here today, it's a familiar passage, and if it's not, then it's an important passage. Familiar or not, it's really strategically important to us. But it's, it is the Christmas and the Advent season, and uh, I want to con- encourage you, and I, I hope this is clear as we, as we look at God's Word this morning uh, and, and what it has to say to us. I, I hope that you will continue to make it a big deal, to celebrate it, to proclaim it, don't pull back. I mean, yeah, we've got COVID and all that, and you know, we want to be responsible and we want to care for other people, but let's don't pull back on the message. And the fact that you can continue to do church and do it online and all that, uh, so, so just want to encourage you to keep going for it and going for it in a big way because it's one of those opportunities we have for the gospel to be clear. So uh, the passage in Matthew 2, which we'll get to, like I mentioned in a moment, is about the, the wise men, the magi, who followed a star or, or you know, a, something in the heaven, the star, <clears throat> Scripture says. So a couple weeks ago, we were uh, driving. Um, uh, it was Thanksgiving weekend, I think. We went to see our family up in the Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley. And somewhere along the drive there, Joy was, started reading this article, and she said, oh, hey, look at this. And she said, uh, it, it, and she started reading this article, and it was an article about how two planets uh, are going to have a, a major conjunction, they call it. Saturn and Jupiter are going to come close together, and on December 21st, which is the shortest and darkest day of the year, I dig it, those two are going to be the closest that they've been in over 800 years. And so, ever since, she, and, and I said to her, oh, 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 oh. Mark that. Send it to me because i got to use that when I preach at Hope. <laughs> and so since then, you know, I've, every single day I've been seeing this, and they're calling it the Christmas star now this year, right? Which is pretty cool. And uh, did I mention that it's almost like God knows what God is doing? And it could be that there's a few million people on the planet that, that haven't thought about God or Jesus or Christmas, but they're reading this article about these two stars uh, and planets that are going to come together, and it's like, well, maybe that's kind of the way God did it when Jesus was born, or now they're calling it the Christmas star. So, so uh, I believe that God uses everything as an opportunity to preach the gospel. And so this passage is about that. Now, uh, you know, if you read, you can read articles and research and all that, and some scholars believe that right around that time when Jesus was uh, thought to be born in, in history, that uh, there's some record that there was another one of these major conjunctions between Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars. That would have, and, and so became, you know, and, and people that watched the sky saw that something was happening and paid attention. Not everybody was paying attention, but some people were. Now, and, and so that, they're saying that, that historically scientists believe it happened. And, and here's my point. Is it possible that God used three of the planets and God, like, planned far in advance 
for those three to come together in a bright spot and get the world's attention right around the time when God was going to break through in time and space. And Jesus, Is it possible that God did that? Yeah, it is. Is it possible that God just put a brand new star that had never been there before in the sky? Is that possible? Yeah, it is. Could it have been any number of other things? It could have been anything. I do not care which one of those things that it was. I know that it was. And this is what I know. God announced and revealed the arrival of the Messiah. Whether God manipulated his created natural order or created a supernatural event, God revealed and announced Jesus. That, my friends, is what our passage of Scripture is about today. Let's pray again together. God, thank you. God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, thank you for the word. Thank you that we have freedom today in this beautiful, beautiful place that you have provided for your church, your, your people here to be together in fellowship, but also to lift up the truth to lift up Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. And during this time, God, when we turn our minds and hearts and thoughts and actions to the hope and beauty and love that Christmas is, Lord, would you multiply that? And as we read this passage today, speak to us in a new and fresh and powerful and maybe for some of us a convicting way. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here we are, Matthew chapter 2. I'll read it for us. You follow along. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the uh, came uh, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, "Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star from the east and have come to worship him." And when King Herod heard this. He was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, quote, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And after they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen went ahead until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were Overjoyed on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and they worshiped him. Amen. Then they opened the treasures, presented and presented him with gifts of gold, incense, myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another way. May God bless the reading, hearing, Understanding, most important, the doing of his word. So here we have this, again, like I said, for many of us, uh, maybe a very familiar passage. Uh, You may recall that in our Bibles, in the New Testament, primarily in the Gospel of Luke and in the Gospel of Matthew is where God has recorded for us how it is that God announced, planned uh, for Jesus to come and how Jesus was born and the initial responses to it. And this is that passage about the Magi, the wise men. Okay, so how many of us, when we were right around third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, uh, got to be a wise man in the school play at Christmas? Come on now. A lot of bathrobes got sanctified. When I was in sixth grade, I got to be one of the wise men. I was all so excited about it, and I wore a bathrobe and that stuff. Yeah, so... uh, and, and so we're, we're familiar with this. Uh, tradition tells us that there were three. Bible doesn't tell us there were three. Uh, just says there were some. 
We, tradition has concluded because the, there were three gifts mentioned, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? So there, there, possibly there were three. There might have been ten. There might have been two. We don't really know, and again, that's not the point, uh, but we know that they came. The uh, Bible doesn't name them, but tradition has named them. And so um, this is a, a little game I play with my family. I do this only when I'm pretty sure they don't know the answer. I say to them, I will give you $100 if you can. And then I give them some obscure thing that I know they don't know the answer to. So I'm going to do this today. I'm going to give you $100. Pastor Drew will pay up because he's, he's got my back. If you, anybody know the traditional three names of the Magi? That's only one. That's only $30. I'm not answering because you might know. <laughs> Do you know? Gaspar, Melchior, Balthazar. Now, the Bible doesn't say that their name. I don't think anybody got it, Pastor. You're, 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 you're good. Woo! Right? You, you, you knew that. I could tell you probably knew. Right? You knew one. You knew one. Right? But here's the thing. I just kind of like the names. They sound like cool dudes from the East, right? Whoever they were, whoever they were, they were like philosophers, scholars, uh, no indication they were Jews or believers per se, but they were seekers, and they, and they recognized and they believed that the gods, whoever the gods were, showed them things. They believed that there were divine forces in the world and that once in a while the world would reveal to them significant things were happening. Are you following what I'm saying? So they studied the stars and they noticed, you know, the planets. And, and don't kid yourself. We think that, you know, because it was ancient times uh, and these were in Persia. So today would be modern Iran, Iraq, you know. We think that, you know, they weren't smart and they weren't scholars. Friends, there are libraries full of scholarly philosophical things that the people, ancient worlds, believed in and, and studied. So these were people, I think that they were paying attention. And because they were paying attention, God utilized that. They were paying attention. They saw something. They believed, they believed, and in this, in this case, they were actually correct. They believed that it, a, a, a heavenly body, a star, or if something uh, a significant or different or profound appeared in the heavens that that was a sign. They didn't exactly name Yahweh, but it was a sign of something significant, of kingly significance. That's why they went and said, who's the king? Because the, the heavens have told us a king has been born. So they were paying attention and they followed now, the, the whole story, let me just I expand. I'm, I'm sure most of us know, but just in case we don't, you know, in, in, in Luke and Matthew, you recall how it is that, you know, uh, a young teenage girl, the angel of the Lord appeared to her and, and, and told her she was chosen to be the mother of the Messiah. An angel came and told her that. Joseph was a man of honor. It was a cultural, uh, it was a cultural uh-oh is what it was. But he was an honorable man. So God sent an angel in a dream to tell Joseph, it's okay. Trust me on this one. And he did. And he said, just, and the angel said, just in case you want a little proof that God will do what God wants to do. By the way, I don't want to be ageist or anything, but that, that older person, Elizabeth, also... Now, that wasn't a miraculous conception. It was just God saying, you know, look, when God wants to do something, God will do it, right? Right? So that's going on. And then when the time comes, uh, the angels show up in the heavens to announce to the shepherds. And then after that, God arranges for a star or a planet or something that someone thousands of miles away was paying attention to and concluded something big is happening here. Here's my point. Incredible contrasts in all the story. Think about this. In the story, the, the, the larger story, the powerful and the weak get the news. The elite and the common 
get the news. The educated and the not educated get the news. The insiders and the outsiders get the news. The religious and the pagans get the news. The believers, whoever they were, and the unbelievers get the news. And and I'm so glad that Scripture records all these because we need to see in all these contrasts. This is my conclusion. Two things. The fact that Jesus was born, and by the way, this is all past tense. Jesus came and still here, right? We know this. Is a big deal for all people. It's a big deal for all people. So big that the angels announced it. So big that God uh, manipulated the heavens to announce it. So big that choirs of heaven announced it. It's a huge, huge deal. And it's for all people. It wasn't for just special people. It wasn't for just just you and your kind. Because we're human beings and we're always looking for us and our kind. We try not to do it, but we're sinful and we do. And the gospel wasn't like that. And so when God was going to break through in time and space and the promised Messiah was going to come, God made sure that everyone got the word. Can I tell you something? God is making sure that's true today, that everyone gets the word. And my point here, one of my points is that that revelation is not really the issue. The Bible does not argue about the revelation of Jesus. It records the revelation of Jesus as the Messiah. That's really not the issue. And, and, and I'm not here to argue philosophically or theologically the, the general or special revelation of God. I mean, I could if you want, but then you would start leaving out the back door. And we, and we can't have that. Wait, we already took the offering, right? So, okay, we're, we're fine. Go ahead. But that's really not the issue. The issue is not revelation. The issue is, and this is where I want us to go, your awareness of Jesus and your response to that awareness. And I would argue this. I've never been on the, the uh, bah humbug train about, about, about Christmas. I understand it's gotten a little out of hand from time to time, commercialism and all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, but I've, I've never really been on that train really complaining about that so much and this is why think about it (laughs) even in covid our entire country and culture has rearranged its focus on christmas and and what's the first syllable of christmas christ and whether the world believes it or not they're acknowledging jesus whether the world believe, understands it or not, all the lights, all the songs, all the th- activities, the idea of gift giving, and all of those things are all about Jesus. And so I've never been one of those like, oh, it's, it sure sucks these days. Christmas is sure got so commercialized. No. I mean, we should be responsible. Let's like don't go crazy, Right? You, you don't need to buy a brand new car every year at Christmas, right? Or ever, probably, but that's a whole different sermon. But, And my family will tell you this. Whenever anyone in my family gets a little on the negative side about Christmas, I also do this to them at Easter, too, but it's Christmas. This is what I say. Joy, all this fuss over Jesus. So, friends... This is what I'm saying to you today, right now, this season, this year. It is really not about whether the the reality that Jesus came. That's not what we're arguing today. God has shown that, proved that, revealed that. God used the angels. God used the heaven. We now have the authoritative, recorded, special revelation of God called the Scriptures. There is no doubt about Jesus. The only challenge is this, friends. How will you respond? That's what I came here today. All of this to say, I'm here to ask you, how will you respond? How will you respond? It's not a question of whether Jesus really came or whether it's historical reality. And the fact that we can trust God's word, you know, one of the things, uh, just in Matthew and Luke alone, 
it, it, there's a little phrase that's attached. This happened to fulfill the scripture when it said. See, just in those two of the New Testament books, over 100 times, it reminds us that God, has, God had been planning this for a long time. God told the prophets, how did they know where Jesus was going to be born? God told them. And they looked it up. Right? So I'm here. I'm here. I'm here to challenge you. And I'm okay. I mean that in, the, in, in a friendly, loving way. Challenge you this morning to consider both your awareness and your response to Jesus. And that's what the story is about. This story is about the response in three different ways. I'm gonna, let's look at those three. Sorry, I'm not used to preaching this. But I told Pastor Drew, if you make me hold a handheld, you only get half a sermon. Because, you know, I'm going to get tired and switch hands here pretty soon. Whew, this one's getting numb already. All right. Three different contexts. Herod is first. King Herod, in, our, in the scripture in verses 2 and 4 and also in verse 7. In each, in each pattern, just asking what's, what's his awareness and what is his response, okay? What is his awareness? What is his response? His awareness is that he was asked about Jesus uh, by these magi, these people who came, Persians probably, wherever they came. He was probably pretty impressed, you know, because Herod was impressed with riches. We know Herod, Herod the Great, built all these great things and and, uh, and all sorts of things. He was, he was enamored and a pursuer of, of riches and glory and prestige. So he was probably pretty excited when these really important people showed up, uh, rich, powerful people. But he was asked about Jesus. He also should have known because he was Jewish. When they asked him about the king of the Jews, he also should have known. This is what he did know. He knew that since centuries before, God had been telling them the true king was coming. Don't think that Herod didn't know this. So his awareness would be that even though he claimed to be the king, he knew in his tradition that the true king was going to come because of the prophecy. So that was his awareness. But what was, what was his response? And we could call it several different ways, but I just put these words down. He was troubled and disturbed. <laughs> he was threatened. And he schemed. Now, let me just go back to Herod for just a minute. If, if you don't know this about Herod the Great, he was a horrible person. He was an evil, evil, horrible person. And I, and I don't say that lightly or, or, or flippantly. Herod was so paranoid about people trying to usurp his power. If he suspected members of his own family, he had them murdered. Anything that he thought would get in the way of him being in control, he would get rid of that. And he is just, his, this is historically known in, uh, about Herod, Herod the Great. And so when these people come and say, where's the king? <laughs> where's the king? Now, uh, you'd, you'd like to think he'd say, oh, thank you, finally, oh, Lord, you're keeping your promises. But he didn't, did he? He was greatly disturbed, and he was threatened, and he schemed, and he did what he thought he needed to do in order to protect himself. Now, if you're like me, you look at Herod, and you go, well, come on. That is crazy days right there. I would never do that. I would never do that were I challenged with the, with the prospect of giving up control of my life. Really? You would, you would never scheme to get out of giving over control of your life? Yeah, you would. Now, this is, this is extreme, what Herod did, but I'm here to confess before you the Bible is clear. Jesus is Lord. And in order for us to live the, the most, the, here, here's the crazy thing. All of the blessing God wants you to have requires you to submit to his lordship. Now, that's church talk, people. We all say that until we have to do it. 
And the reason that Herod's response is important, we can't excuse the fact that he was a violent, horrible person. We have to ask ourselves, what was driving that? He felt threatened because he understood, if I'm not in charge of me and I have to give over charge of me to someone else, if I'm being really honest with myself, I feel a little threatened by that. And it, and it comes out in lots of different ways in our lives. So Herod's response is uh, too often uh, our response. Being aware of who Jesus is, uh, sometimes we scheme to get out of that. I, I, I just don't want to give over everything to the Lord. Not everything, just, just a few things that make me look good in front of Pastor Drew and Tamara. Second group, the scribes. The scribes, what was their awareness of the Messiah, of Jesus? Well, like good Jews, they also would have said, yeah, you know, for centuries we've been teaching in scribe class, Bible study, every day at 10 a.m. online, virtually, right? We've been teaching this for a long time that the Messiah is going to come. So if, if someone comes and says, hey, where's the king of the Jews? Part of them would be like, yeah, we've heard this before. Maybe they had it memorized. Maybe they didn't. It doesn't really say. But it does say that, that, that they knew where to find the answer, so they did. This is what they did. Their response was they uh, did the research and found out that, that, that God had already told them it was going to be in Bethlehem. They instructed others because that was their job. They were teachers. They knew the word. They taught the word. They instructed Herod and the Magi. So they did the research. They got the answer. They taught others. And then pretty much just were like, it seems, ignored it. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, Messiah's coming. Oh, yeah, it's going to be in Bethlehem. All right. Uh, I got a Starbucks date over here, so you guys have a, have, have a safe trip. Now, I, I hope and pray that somewhere along the lines, maybe later on, some of these scribes were individuals who were still there when Jesus came back. You know, that's, that's for God. God knows that. I, I don't know. But as far as our story goes, it seems like they did the research, they had the knowledge, they told others about it, but it didn't really change much about what they did. And here's this is another ouch passage for us, my friends, because a lot of us in this beautiful spot today are kind of like them. We know a lot of stuff. I know a lot of stuff. I mean, I went to school for, uh, I mean, of course, I started in the fourth grade, and so I finished, you know, early. But, you know, I know a lot of stuff. And it makes what difference some days, right? And the problem with a church that is off mission or weak or not on point it's, not, it's probably not that we don't know stuff. It's that it doesn't really mean anything to us or we don't do anything with it, right? This is why I love, every time I come here, I love when you hold up God's word. You're not worshiping the book. You're worshiping the God who gave you his, his word in, in the Bible, right? I love that even during this time, pastor, you haven't gotten tired six or seven or eight months later to every day still read the word, right? So, it's, and so we need to be committed to it. But here, here's the challenge, right? Awareness, response, right? So if you're here today and you never heard this story before, praise God. What an opportunity. You're, you're getting to hear what God wants you to hear today. That G God broke through time and space. It's recorded for us in the Bible. There's no question about it. Now, what are you going to do about it? It's also true that most of us probably could tell the story. The question is, how will we respond? And the challenge is, and again, I hope many of you, if you know me, I'm not, I'm not like a negative willy type. It's not my nature, right? I'm positive. I believe in that and, and all that. So I'm not here to say, oh, all that. I just want to be honest with myself, and I want us, you to be honest with yourself. That when, when God reveals himself, and Christmas time right now is a big reminder of who Jesus is. Now, what difference will it make? For the scribes, apparently, didn't make much difference. So, that brings us to the third group, right? So, Herod uh, got all defensive. He was like, oh, I, don't, I don't think, you know, I, I don't want any king being the boss of me, because I'd have to give up stuff. 
right? And the scribes are like, yeah, here's all the knowledge, but uh, I got other things. I don't really want it to change how I do stuff. But the Magi, their awareness was it started out in theological terms. We would call it uh, natural or general revelation, right? It's not like they had the, uh, the scriptures or it doesn't say that they had the scriptures. It's that God revealed himself in the heavens in his own creation. But here's what they did. They took that initial awareness and they pursued the answer. They followed God's direction. They followed, they asked questions, they listened to the answers. And by the way, in every case, in all three, especially with the scribes and the Magi, but Herod would be true, where was the answer found about Jesus? In the Word. In the word, right? That's where the answer was. And so this, the Magi, they pursued the answers, they followed it, and they responded with great joy because they believed, even though at the time they didn't really understand that. I would, I would love to have listened to them talking about this, especially after they heard from the scribes about the Jewish Messiah, the Christ. I would have loved to have heard their conversations like, oh my gosh. We're actually going to go and see the king that God has promised. And they got themselves totally jazzed about that. And when they found it, they weren't freaked out that it was a baby because they understood that the king was the king. They believed that God had done a miraculous thing. They trusted that God had already revealed where the king would be found. And so they went and found Jesus. And when they did... They worshiped, and there was great joy. They weren't threatened like Herod. They weren't lackadaisical like the scribes. They were excited to embrace the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so, really, we can sum this up in a very, very straightforward way this morning. And it's the heart condition of each of, the three, of each of these three scenarios, right? Herod responded with a hard heart. It was hard and calloused. The scribes responded with a half heart. They knew, they were, but they were like, eh, not all the way in. But the magi, they were wholehearted. They went for it. They found the answer. They responded. And they experience joy through worship. And the truth is for, for every one of us. And, and here, here's the thing. I've, I've discovered this to be true in my own life. Sometimes I have to keep coming back to this. <laughs> Sometimes I just have to confess and say, man, I'm just, I'm just being a hard-hearted person today. i got to stop that. A lot of times, a lot more times, I'm, I'm more like the scribes because I know stuff. I tell people like I'm a professional Christian. It's what I do. Sometimes that's real dangerous for me. But man, on those times in that period of time when I let my heart be open and full, fully respond, take the risk of of asking God to actually be the Lord that he already is, by the way. (laughs) To take what I know and apply it to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and respond wholeheartedly, not half, but wholeheartedly. I believe that what we have here is an example of what happens. Great joy through worship and the recognition. There's no better time right now. I mentioned it before, because it's Christmas, the awareness of Jesus is all around you. For many of us, it's a time to have a new wholehearted response. But here's also my prayer. Like I said, there's millions of people around the world that that know it's Christmas but don't know why it's really important. What if we were like the Magi? What if our language was the language of the Magi? And you know what they said? Where is he? Where is he? Because wherever he is, I'm going there. What if this community, Hope Community, adopted the language of the Magi and said, where is Jesus that we may worship him? 
It's the time, friends. It's the time for wholehearted response to who Jesus is. Let me pray with us again. God, make it new and fresh. Make, make the story, God, new and fresh. May there not be one, one person among us who thinks, oh, yeah, I know that story. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that story. I can tell that story. But rather, Lord, make it so that we live the story today. Thank you for these magi, whoever they were, however ever many there were, whatever their names were, who model for us what it looks like to pursue the truth and then respond. And I declare, God, and I agree with the pastors of this church, there is no doubt in who Jesus is. There is no doubt in what the gospel is about. There is no doubt that the invitation is for all to respond to Jesus. I declare it over these folks with great thanksgiving. I declare it in my own mind, in my own heart. And God, would you give us the opportunity to share that good news, especially during this Advent season. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we don't like to end the Sunday service that we don't give you an opportunity to accept Jesus in the heart. You know, we can assume that we're all saved, but um, that would not be a wise thing, I believe. And for some of you who are watching on the Internet, um, maybe you need to accept Jesus in your heart. I said, Pastor, how do we do that? It's so simple. You just, just allow God who's knocking at your door to say, come in. I'm going to uh, make you the Lord of my life. You're going to be in charge now. If you want to do that right now with me, just repeat this after me. Jesus, come in my heart. I want to make you my Lord. I want to become a Christian today. Forgive me for all my sins. I repent. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, we believe if you say that prayer, that Jesus came in your heart, and we know what will happen, he'll start to change you from the inside out. I say this unapologetically. I want to be your pastor, and I ask you to make a commitment to start coming. Sunday, come here. Wednesday, watch us through the internet, but we're going to open up soon on Wednesday. Start coming Sunday and Wednesday. Give us a year. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Watch what will happen. God will start training you and, con and, and, and conforming you, and you'll start looking more and more like Jesus. Now, my thought is there's three kind of people here. There's hard-hearted people here. How many know we all can be hard-hearted sometimes? There's uh, half-hearted people here. I mean, no, sometimes we can be one foot in and one foot out. And there's wholehearted people here. And uh, we thank God for all of you. But we have an opportunity to all be wholehearted. If you're wholehearted, don't grow weary in doing good. Don't stop. If you're half-hearted, Recognize, man, I gotta, what am I doing? I mean, we only have so much time left. Now is not the time to have one foot in and one foot out. If you're hard hearted, God is speaking to you and He's saying, I'm right there at the door. All you have to do is just come on in. Make that decision today with every head bowed and every eyes closed. If you're in, in, well, <laughs> if you're half-hearted or you're whole or you're or you're hard-hearted, don't be afraid. I want you to raise your hand and say, Pastor, I want you to pray with me. This message is for me. Thank you. Thank you for having the boldness to it. Thank you. Oh my goodness. God is so good. Thank you. I'm so appreciative of your willingness. Because here's the deal: until you get your hand up, God can't change you. He won't change you. He wants to help, but you've got to make that initiative. Father, I pray for these hands all over the room that are up. 
Father, help us all to be completely sold out for Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Sing with it, this with me. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore that's here. Could you just stretch out your hands to Dr. Nolte and his wife? Father, we just thank you for the anointing on their life. We thank you, Father, for this message. Father, we thank you that the ministry and the um, outreach and the all the things that you have planned, that the days in front of them are greater than the days behind them. And Father, we thank you for courage and strength we thank you for health and healing. Father, we thank you for wholeness in every aspect of their life. We thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, how many glad, how many still glad you came to church today? Amen. How many like to be encouraged? How many were encouraged today? How many were challenged a little bit today? How many felt smacked around a little bit by the power of the Holy Spirit? How many know sometimes it's good to be? Sometimes, sometimes I'll, my, my son will be uh, in the kitchen or something, and I'll just, I'll just, just, I'll just, I'll just crush him up against the boards, you know, like a, you know what, how many know, to whom God loves, he disciplines, and so that's all just part of God's love. Listen, we're so proud of you, we're so proud of what God is doing in our, in our hearts and in our lives, um, if we can have uh, the elders come on up front, first of all. Um, can we have elders come on up front right now? Say, so why are they coming up front? Because they are going to pray for you. There's a lot of times when the preaching ministers, and that's awesome, but sometimes we just need prayer. Amen? And so if they have somebody with them, just they'll be here the whole time. Just sit down in the front. And they'll and just wait, and then they'll pray with you. And then, um, uh, do, do, do you have do you have your yeah, yeah good Bill? Do you, can you guys come on up front? We're starting to do this um, every Sunday, and uh, how, how many know we need to declare victory? How many know we need to de de declare victory in our nation? How many know our nation is, I believe, at a precipice, and we just have, listen, if somebody is going to be praying for our and declaring victory, it's got to be us, amen? And so um, how about, how, how many have some family, I'm not asking you to raise your hands, but, but we have family members and they're gone astray. We need to declare victory over their life and declare that they're coming back to the things of God. And then in our church, how many know we still have some victories to, to pursue? And God is pursuing those with, with us, but, but we need to declare those things. So that's part of what we do. Guys, go ahead. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. And then, um, I don't know if you know, but if you don't know, let me tell you what. You know what you were created for, according to Ephesians? 
You were created for good works. Let's say it together. I am created for good works. So Pastor Joel will be right on over here. Pastor Joel, wave to us. What, what's, what's he over there with that uh, computer over there? Here's why. Because he's going to sign you up. What's he, what's he going to sign me up for? He's going to sign you up, and we believe that all of us can, can give two hours, come donate some of our time, and help our church. And so we're asking you to be part of that. So go on over there, sign up. Um, if you want to go over there and sign up, you can get on the internet, discoverhope.us, and, um, and sign up for two hours this week. That would be a huge blessing, and we thank God for it. Of course, Esperanza tonight. Yeah. Come on, 6 o'clock. If, if, if you know someone, and you probably do, who uh, Spanish is their first language, they're looking for a Spanish-speaking church, we have an awesome one right here with us. And we thank God for Pastor George and his wife and their leadership. They're such a blessing. And the whole team at Esperanza is such a blessing. But be part of that and come and invite some. Yeah. Amen. All right, last but not least, can I speak a blessing over you? Oh, Father, I call these people blessed. You said if we're willing and obedient, we'll eat the fat of the land. That's what you said. And these people are willing. They're obedient. They've come to worship you and to listen to the word of God and be changed. So, Father, I thank you for a great week, a great month. Father, I thank you for the things that concern them. We cast our care upon you, for you care for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. I want to remind you at Hope, people are our heart. Generosity is our opportunity. Excellence is our spirit. Say it with me. Smiling is our favorite. And Jesus Christ is our Lord. We love you. God love you. You are dismissed.